Hello, everyone. Welcome. I see people joining. So we'll be chilling in here um, for yeah some seconds. Uh, let's do the classic, James. Let's talk about the weather. Here mm -hmm. in New York is boiling. <laughs> what about London? Not very good recently. We've had the season switch, you know, once every two weeks, it feels like. I don't feel like summer's started yet. Uh, hey, what a classic. <laughs> <laughs> not, not, that, um, not that we're going to complain about London. No, no. Okay. Next time, um, welcome everyone. Next time we'll have some, also some elevator music for you all. Um, but hey, uh, probably we want to start kicking off now. Uh, yeah, people are joining, but it's, uh, you know, let's let's kick off and, uh, you know, welcome everyone. Uh, we are very, very excited to have you here. I'm Julio Martinez, your host today. I'm the co-founder and the CEO of Abacom. And it's, of course, my absolute pleasure to welcome you. Um, I'm incredibly excited about the content we have for today in this webinar. Um, and, you know, we have here, uh, I'm sharing a stage with the always awesome James Ferguson, our, resi as our resident solutions uh, consultant. Uh, how are you doing, James? Yeah, really good. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Really looking forward to today's session. Thanks for the intro, Julio. <laughs> well, we're very excited to have you here. And hey, in terms of contents, the agenda for the session will be about 45, 50 minutes. And our conversation is going to split into four parts. First, a very short introduction about Abacum and what we do. So you have us in the map. Second, we'll be talking about some of the challenges of the budgeting season, many. Uh, third, we'll be sharing some best practices, some guidelines, particularly five actionable guidelines to solve those challenges. And finally, we'll be looking at some ways of leveraging technology um, to, to, you know, for the next budgeting season. Um, of course, we'll be allocating sometimes, uh, sometimes uh, towards the end for Q&A. So please don't hesitate to be active. Drop notes in the chat, in the questions, in the Q&A section uh, of, of, of Zoom here. And we'll be addressing those uh, as much as possible um, at the end of the session. Otherwise, we'll, we'll reach out separately. But hey, super excited to be, to be making of this an interactive session. Good. First part of the session, a little bit about us. We are the leading financial planning and analysis platform for companies in the mid-market. We have uh, global operations. Uh, I'm based in New York with a part of the team. Um, James is based in London with another part of the team. And then we also have product development in some other countries. So, you know, um, US, Europe, and LATAM is probably, you know, a, a good representation of our footprint. And you know we are a white combinator company and backed by some other stellar uh, investors. In terms of who you have in front of uh, you, uh, both James and I have uh, probably too many years uh, in in finance in the trenches, uh, living in the head, uh, probably in your positions. Uh, so yeah, we we hopefully bring some good experience not only from what we've lived but also what we see in our customers. We work with many many companies, as you will see in the next slide. This is just um, a quick slide. Uh, I encourage you to visit our um, G2 review page. We have the best ratings, but more importantly, we are super proud to be working with this amazing um, customer footprint, both in the, in the markets that I've mentioned. Hey, we do FinTech, mobility, B2B SaaS, marketplaces, B2C. So really industry agnostic. We have a lot of flexibility to cater different industries and companies from hey, 200 to 3,000 employees. So this is what we consider the market. So this is, this is a good representation of the amazing customers we are proud to work with. Good. Without further, without further delay, let's kick off uh, to discuss budgeting. Um, folks, <laughs> winter is coming. Uh, today feels like summer holidays. But we all know that the budget season is just around the corner. And hey, when I was doing that, I recall you know ha having all those promises and lessons learned from previous years, and then probably falling short when it came to you know, getting ready for the next time. Now it's the time of the year to get ready 
for the next budgeting season. Now you have the opportunity to really fulfill those processes, uh, those promises, and really build a more effective uh, budgeting season uh, starting in September, October. Okay. So how does it look like, like the, the, perfect, the perfect budget season? Um, maybe, maybe the CEO is setting achievable goals for once and, and, the, leaders, and the leadership directives stay the same. Uh, maybe then department heads give you everything you need on time. You find consistent and clean data without issues. Uh, no late nights, no revisions. Everybody's aligned company-wide. And hey, no one drinks too much coffee. Uh, how does that sound? Well, probably not very realistic. Sounds good, but probably, probably you know uh, it's not going to happen. Uh, the budget uh, season faces many challenges and rarely goes smoothly unfortunately. Um, the, the, the problem with budgeting is that rarely goes as planned, <laughs> ironically. Uh, you, you've likely felt these pains before having to work through inaccurate data, right? And um, some of the problems you have on, on screen or many others, uh, inaccurate data or filling the data gaps, too many assumptions, like everything's very difficult to achieve. Uh, you've experienced the madness of chasing check sh shareholders and, and stakeholders to meet your deadlines, uh, often very, getting very frustrated with their lack of urgency, not enough buy-in in certain areas of the business, in some organization, um, in some parts of the organization. You, you have probably experienced the impact of the macro factors on your well-made plans have had to accommodate uh, for those factors, right? Probably you've had to start all over again because the CEO wanted an assumption, build it in the model in a different way because something has changed. Again, a lot of uncertainty in these current market conditions. And, and hey, the truth of the matter is that traditional budgeting practices are not very efficient, right? They are very time consuming, they are manual, they are error prone, um, and they haven't changed enough for many years. So year and year again, we find the same issues hitting us. But hey, uh, we, we you know that, and I'm just here to raise that awareness that you are very aware um, of because you've you've been you've been through that many times. The good news is that you know while a budget season will never be completely perfect, there is a lot you can do right now before the season starts to level up your game and your processes. And you still got time to nail it, right? So we're gonna go three go right now through five best practices um, for you to make it happen. First one. Look, the budgeting process starts with a good strategy. The budgeting season and the budgeting process needs to start with a strategic clarity. You will you will kick it off in September. That's gonna be you know two three months for potentially like in, in worst case scenario or you know I've seen companies in the six months which is madness. So hopefully you are in this two three months range. But hey, strategy and budget must go hand in hand, and you are not pulling a new strategy in two three months. So your preparation starts with a fact finding mission. What's the overall business strategy? And I'm, I'm surprised sometimes how in finance or some of the PNA teams might be a little bit decoupled from that, right? Uh, what are the main business goals? What is the company really trying to achieve? Hey, I'm, I'm, I mean, three, four, five things, not more than that, right? Keep it simple. But also enrich it. How is competition behaving? What are the bottlenecks in your business? What are the industry trends that we need to account for? What about microeconomics? Right? So think of begin your budget season with that strategic and macro clarity. Begin by establishing what's the long-term goal of the, of the business. Uh, and hey, that might be a multi-year plan broken down into annual budgets. Uh, that can be done in a different way. But what's critical is that you spend quality time with senior leadership in the business, understanding the gist and the crux of, his, of it so that you can build then your leading indicators, your lagging indicators, your KPIs, your operational plan, your budget, your financials, like everything. But it comes down from what's top of mind for your leadership team. Of course, you need to take into account both external factors and internal factors. Hey, internal external factors, you, you, you know the drill, but what is affecting your performance? That might, that might be manufacturing shortages or AI disrupting a part of your business or a new legislation or, what is really shaping your industry? 
are, you know, do you have that top of mind so you can inform better uh, assumptions? Then, of course, you need to account for internal factors, current employee um, skill gaps, for instance, geographic uh, markets to target, product issues or advantages, internal productivity, available resources. You need to be connected with that pulse of the business so you can then start your budgeting season with all this information that you need to uh, yeah, put forward in the, in the budget, in the plan, in the model. So, hey, stay connected with the business. You can start doing that now if you haven't yet. Uh, get some kickoff sessions early on, understand the strategy, and it's not you don't need to boil the ocean. But that strategic understanding is key um, to kick off your budgeting season. Second key guideline best practice, top-down and bottom-up budgeting. Hey, like this is very popular everywhere, right? So you, you will hear plenty of resources, not top down, bottom up. And, you know, hey, the reality is that obviously you need both to make the magic happen because the magic happens in the conversations that lead when those clash, right? So it's not one or the other. It's actually both and making happen those conversations. And, and this is where really finance teams thrive or should be thriving. You know, where you can become the hero in your organization is when, when you're really driving those better decisions in the business is when you are using both for the stakeholders, for your stakeholders to have that meaningful conversation. And look, of course, uh, top down very briefly for those that are maybe less, less, less aware of that is top down means you are establishing very clear objectives with resource allocation based on what you need to accomplish, to be successful. Hey, I want to be IPO ready. That means I hit these metrics, right? For instance, it's top down. Um, then you will review your sales capacity, your CAC, your pipeline coverage, whatever metrics and levers you need to pull to make those strategic goals happen. That usually comes from the board of directors, from the CEO, from the leadership team, right? So you usually, you know, find it cascaded down. Look, it, it, it's very, you know, it's very powerful. It increases your chance of hitting more ambitious targets, but it's not very collaborative, of course, and sometimes it's unrealistic to department heads. On the other side, you've got the bottom up, which provides you a more accurate forecast. Uh, it's a good representation of uh, depart uh, departmental commitments and, and usually improves collaboration and, and buying from people, uh, but also tend to be less ambitious, right? And, and you know, it's less likely that then you hit those strategic goals. So, hey, the role of finance is really to mediate in both, right? You need to be working with senior leadership, with the CEO, with, you know, and then obviously your, your CFO, people finance, like you need to be top of those strategic goals that are a good representation of the strategy, but also you need to be business partnering, right? The concept of business partnering it ultimately shines here in the budgeting season where you are aligning those top um, uh, top down objectives with the real capacity of the business, and then you're working in this gray area where the two numbers don't really align, so that you can create a plan to mitigate that and make the action happen. Right. So by creating um, that space for conversations and aligning leadership strategic goals with the practical insights of the business, like it is how you can make your budgeting season very successful. So start thinking ahead of you know, of time and think like how I'm gonna get my bottom up and my top down um, budget and model built. What do I need to have? What is the data that I require? How I will approach it? So you, you can start having those um, early preparations and conversations. Then third, um, that's something uh, typically very painful and we're gonna have a short snippet here from you know, super insightful, uh, but before we get there, you know, of course, improving your data collection, your visibility and accuracy. Um, hey, you need to make it very easy for your stakeholders to provide you with clean data. And the introduction of templates uh, to simplify data management is a very easy way. You've been many times managing, you know, dirty data and, and we know those pains. So, you know, providing a range of different spreadsheets and columns, values that they need to, you know, fill in and that that we know how it ends right so endless slack conversations google sheets excels back and forth email like it's very it, it's it's very chaotic right so you can save your time 
you can set your um, time and, and pain through templates that are based on standardized fields and formats, and you can easily map data to these fields. Uh, so you have a very clear central depository that makes your life easier. That can actually be automated via APIs. So we can double click on that later if you, if you want. And then you also have integrations so that this standardized template becomes an automated template that makes all the data that you need to collect um, you know, flowing automatically to your fingertips so you can manipulate it very easily. Um, hey, uh, I think um, I'm gonna, in the interest of time, think of uh, having Richard Haren here. Uh, he's the CFO of Rapid SOS. Rapid SOS is a Silicon Valley-based company that is amazing. They have raised over 350 million, super successful. Uh, they have grown very fast, very ambitious people, very ambitious uh, and a sophisticated finance team. And, and he shares, uh, we, we had a, a recent conversation with him where he was sharing how he built real-time budgeting operations and the need to take budget owners on the journey of why clean data matters. That's critical. So let us share that snippet. Uh, I think it's very insightful. And so I think this is now, now that we've kind of had the initial rollout, people are starting to understand the, oh, here's the top level view of the company that I see. Well, what about this? And they're starting to ask all the what ifs that they should be, which is how do we get down to level two or how do we get down to level three? In order to do that, though, we have to have the data in order to give them those insights. And so really for us now, you know, a lot of a lot of those types of questions about how do we get in and look at our different market segments? How do we look at our different product types? How do we look at different geographies? How do we even look at different teams? Um, all of that is, is the stuff they're now wanting to consume. But at the same time, it's a, we need this collaboration and getting the right data into the system. And so, you know, kind of back when we asked the question like, hey, how enthusiastic were they to accept Abacom and have these dashboards? They absolutely loved that. Uh, what they didn't like initially was kind of some of this concept of, oh, we need to collect clean data. So yes, this means you're going to need to spend a little bit more time reviewing data, making sure we have all the right tags. In it. So I think, you know, up front, there wasn't a good understanding of why we need to do that. Now I think they understand. It's like they want to see the level two, the level three analysis, uh, but we have to partner with them to make sure we're getting all the right data in. So that's really where we're at in the next step of the journey. But I saw it as a natural progression. You know, we couldn't get there if they didn't have the high level insights. But those high level insights then really gave them that thirst to see the next level down. And so now they're really partnering us. And, and how do we build out this kind of more robust data platform and keep as much pollution out of it as we can? Thank you for that. I think uh, Richard is great. And, you know, it's not only about sharing those templates, but of course, having those pre-submission meetings, uh, making them understand why that clean data matters to you, but also for the rest of the organization and then for your own stakeholders uh, as they need to um, have more data granularity to make better decisions, to prioritize different geographies, new products, whatever is needed. Okay. Look, let's go to the next best practice. This is a very cool one, um, of course, and it's a driving stakeholder collaboration and alignment. It's probably very close to business partnering, uh, but also project management, right? And, and, and hey, a budget season is basically a huge project that needs strong leadership to drive it forward. So it should be treated in the same way as a product launch is managed or as an M&A deal is managed with clear kickoff, checkpoints, accountability, so there is a lot of project management and rigor and enforcing discipline and enhancing your own credibility and professionalism within the organization so that people respect those deadlines, the information that they need to send you in quality and form and timelines. That's critical. Uh, hey, obviously, to make this process easy, it's vital to build that relationship during the year and especially a little bit ahead of the planning cycle, right? And the budgeting cycle, you want to intensify that with budget holders and, and help them understand the bigger picture. And you need to be sitting with them and helping them understand why that time and that investment is critical for them. It's not only because I want to get my resource allocation and my budget, what's my budget for me to spend? Like, hey, this is this is a way more important uh, conversation than, than, your, than your silo, right? Uh, you, you will probably need to moderate and you need to be better equipped to do that difficult conversations because you understand the levers 
that drive performance, particularly revenue is usually very, you know, uh, tense. Uh, hitting revenue targets means agreeing on specific metrics, right? The, the sales close one rate or, or the pipeline coverage three, four, five times what's the retention rate. Uh, you know, those metrics are very intertwined, obviously, in the model. And, you know, improving one means that we can be more relaxed on the other. So you, you will have those natural tensions in the organization. It's your responsibility as a finance team and an FP&A team to be well equipped to advise the business and to moderate those. Look, finally, of course, our best practice is to document all this process digitally. Then the, lead, the year is very long. Right? You need to understand who has agreed to what by which date. It needs to be documented digitally. So you can refer back to all these commitments that as a leadership team, as a management team, people made. Very important. You want to keep your budget owners accountable. It's not micromanagement. It's you know the basis of driving performance in an organization. What's ultimate, ultimately the main goal of a finance team, driving performance in an organization. And then you do that by empowering them to make bold decisions with data around the strategic objectives. And hey, finally, you know, how do, how do you how do you think of improving the process for the long term? You know, the budgeting season is an annual event and an annual process. You know, hopefully a couple of months. Um, they, ha they can go way longer. But probably you want to think of it as a constant operation. One of the biggest pains of the budgeting process is how quickly it needs to be readjusted, how quickly it is old, how potentially in February or March, you, you know, you are generating new versions of that budget. And, you know, so I obviously, you know, that uh, adopting a rolling forecast strategy is, is great. It's not always possible. It's not always advisable um, to do that investment. So it, it depends on the business. But you know, thinking of a rolling forecast or a monthly reforecasting, at least quarterly reforecasting basis, uh, it's going to be great to improve your you know flexibility, to keep department heads with more freedom, to you know overall be more accurate with your projections, keep a better grip on the business, the performance, right? So, so of course that reforecasting. So when you are doing your budgeting season. Uh, think already, how do I make my life easier if I want to be an agent of performance in the company during the rest of the year? So therefore, you, you don't think of budgeting as, a, as an isolated event. You, you need to be monitoring um, performance across the year by department to be successful and, and obviously building like this dashboard for all the department heads with real-time data for them to access that dashboard and that agreement and alignment and commitment on key metrics where everyone, when everyone is gonna go to check the key metrics every month when we will forecast, where we will judge performance. Hey, how are we defining key metrics? Is my CAC definition the same as marketing's definition? How, how do we clear all that noise? So then during the year, we can have very meaningful performance conversations on what matters, removing all the noise. This is critical. And this you, need, you want to anchor in the budgeting cycle. Then in, in, in freaking April, you don't want to be talking about, hey, what was CAC and then having noise in the data? No, you want to be talking about removing bottlenecks to grow your business faster, to achieve profitability faster, to go IPO earlier, whatever your strategic goal is. So, of course, we recommend looking at uh, tools for automation, uh, especially those that are supporting AI forecasting, ML forecasting, that can be very powerful depending on your type of business and volume of data, basically, but baseline forecasting based on those last years of results for, by each department, that can, that can give you an edge. Um, at the same time, um, just because the budgeting season is over, uh, hopefully by November uh, or maximum mid-December, uh, it doesn't mean that project management should, should stop, right? So of course you want to have regular reforecasting meeting or rebudgeting meetings with all the department heads. Uh, and hopefully you can also have a forum with senior leadership to then sit all and judge performance, right? So we went through this five best practices, uh, and those are amazing. And look, we see our customer base really thriving through those. I'm more than happy to double click and expand on them 
But the problem of all of them typically is that, hey, it's time consuming. So budgeting is not only a very time consuming endeavor per se, is also the problem is compounded by finance teams being very short on time. I'm very short on time. You are very short on time. So you don't always have enough time to project manage efficiently, to have all the clean data that you want to have, to build that true partnership with the stakeholders that comes out of your value additive conversations, not about chasing them. It's, it's about, you know, hey, I'm sharing good insights that makes you better. Um, you don't have the time to build those dashboards and drive alignment towards them so that you can judge performance as a team later on. It's time consuming and you have a day to day that is probably very, you know, uh, yeah, busy. So <laughs> we know that. So th those great intentions and plans will come apart uh, within the budgeting process. So that's why you want to take a long term view today and, you know, start preparing today for a successful 2025 budget uh, process. And the good news is that you can effectively transform this budgeting process. You can incorporate these best practices in a very effective way. Look, for us uh, here at Avacom, our mantra is that finance teams are the heroes in their organization. And actually, uh, they are the hero because they are the agent of change. They drive change, they drive performance. So having, having a 360 view of performance and understanding all the data and being connected with every department. Think of it, there are not many fine, there are no other department that has all the data in the company and that is a stakeholder for, for all the departments. But we are in finance uniquely positioned to drive change and drive performance. And this is um, what modern finance teams are doing and we are seeing that impact across our um, customer base. So if you invest the time now, if you put the levers in place, you can have uh, an amazing impact and, and multiply your impact in the organization. So now I'm gonna hand over to James, who will show you what um, you know budgeting for 2025 could look uh, with Abacum, uh, just as, as an example as to how you can leverage technology to drive that automation, that data visibility and granularity and dimensionality to be very effective in planning. Thank you so much. And James, the floor is yours. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Julio. That's great. Um, I will aim to show about 20 to 25 minutes of, of Abacum, the functionality around budget, budgeting. Please keep me honest, Julio. I, you know, I like to talk about the tool. Um, if I am creeping towards, you know, past the 55 minute mark, just let me know. I'm sure I won't. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to take you through a demonstration tying back to these best practices that Julio has been talking about. So how we can use Abacum to revolutionize the annual budgeting process. And we'll do this in context of revenue, headcount and OPEX planning. So through this session, you'll see how finance teams leverage tools to streamline the budget process, improve data collection and enhance that critical stakeholder alignment and collaboration. Now, before we get on to the topic of today, let's just take a moment to understand some key sections within the tool. And I'll do that by looking at this left-hand navigation panel here. And we'll touch on a couple of these. So integrations, this allows our customers to manage their connections to different source systems on a self-serve basis. Um, so your financial and operational data from all of your source systems flows seamlessly into your models eliminating silos and providing a really unified view of the business. Then we have our data set section. This is where you perform your data management. We start capturing dimensions as labels or categories for your data. And just to make a point there, with Abacum, you can create an unlimited number of dimensions to clearly organize information. You can then create structures and hierarchies on top of those dimensions, allowing you to map and analyze the information that you're pulling into the system and you're capturing from your different stakeholders the way you need to. Also, Abacom has a powerful low-code ETL functionality in here to cleanse your data automatically upon syncing to the tool. So it's ripe for analysis, it's ripe for your projections and your plans. Next, we'll move on to dimensions. This is just briefly because we'll come back to this and we'll talk about this in the session. This Part of the tool allows you to manage your dimensions, those mappings, those structures, relationships between dimensions that are being pulled from different source systems. Versions are your different versions of the future, like forecasts, budgets, and scenarios. 
unlike scenarios in spreadsheets that become static as, as soon as you make a copy, versions in Abacum are live, meaning, and you'll see this in today's session, if your inputs and assumptions have changed, all of your scenarios are being updated. Models is where you define the numbers that matter to you. So much like a tab in, in your spreadsheets where you define or you create your sales capacity model, revenue model, for example, but in Abacum, your models are always up to date. So no more rolling forward workbooks every time you want to make an update. And then finally, spaces, what we're looking at right here. This is where your C-suite, your board, all of your stakeholders will spend all of their time and, and really where you get to shine. So within a space, you get to tell your story with really easy to understand visualizations and multimedia, as you'll see I'm, as I'm scrolling down the page. You can keep your budget owners accountable for their results by showing them where they're off, asking them to update their assumptions. And finally, really drive that strategic impact within your business by communicating with your stakeholders directly through commentary, tasks and workflows. And this is where we'll be spending all of our time today, because in the end, this is where you surface your data and models in a collaborative workspace for all of your stakeholders. So starting from the top here, we have our budgeting dashboard for 2025. And, and this space allows us to manage the entire planning process, providing a centralized view for finance to uh, and leadership really to see in real time a view of metrics, and a roll up of inputs from budget owners in their own respective spaces. So at the top here, kind of look at this as your command center. We've got different statuses of different spaces that we've pushed out to our department owners. So as they're progressing through their, their kind of workflow and their own processes, you have this cockpit view of what's going on and you can dive into relevant spaces as and where needed. And I think this really touches on and what we're going to touch on now is this collaboration and the project management piece, which is so critical to driving a successful budgeting process. Um, so again, these statuses are super powerful. And, and basically, once we've, met, we've, we've seen changes have been made to templates and, and spaces, statuses are changed, you'll notice that user access and permissions also change with those statuses. So the, these drive notifications also um so for example as and when our vp of sales has gone through their workflow they provided their inputs around new arr for example they've changed the status to, to review this drives notifications to relevant stakeholders the finance team potentially through email through slack or in system um, and that could be the signal to schedule a pre-submission meeting with the department head to review the budget address any concerns or questions or if you prefer you could manage this asynch asynchronously given all of the collaboration features like tasks, commentary, um, which we're gonna to touch on in just a moment. So on top of this, kind of the multimedia and collaboration tools in Abacom really bring stakeholders together efficiently. So to talk about those for a moment, here's the workflow process laid out for the budgeting season. And this really streamlines this process by allowing us to set tasks, deadlines, and track the progress of task completion. So again, as people receive commentary and, and deadlines, they'll receive these notifications through whichever media makes sense, ensuring those that are involved in this process are all on the same page. Additionally, we'll come back to this in just a moment. We've provided stamp standardized templates for our budget owners to submit their inputs, like this one for the sales leader, which is where we're gonna focus on shortly. Um, and really, I'm sure you you understand this, but the, the templates, as you'll see shortly, really ensure consistency and simplify data entry. One last piece on some of the collaboration before we take a look at our, our actual space that we've built out here. We can see that we've got some collaboration and commentary history between all of our stakeholders visible right here on this, this section of the page. So... You know, the real time commentary, the workflow steps, this enhances communication and really drives and expedites decision making and allows you to foster that collaborative environment to keep your budget owners accountable. We can see here in this commentary that our uh, head of finance has been tagged. We've identified a gap for the back end of 2025 for new ARR. And this is something that our sales lead needs to address. And we're going to run through that story with our kind of top-down and bottom-up budgeting as we run through this. 
So looking at this space, we can you know switch between different sections in here, but you'll notice that this is organized to present views of the top-down budget for ARR. We're then seeing our bottom-up inputs from our sales leader being rolled up into this top-level space. We're planning for existing ARR and churn, moving through cost projections across cost of sales, staff and non-staff costs. And finally, a view of the PL and metrics like EBITDA, runway and cash, those that matter to you. And I think importantly here, using a tool, our stakeholders have insights into fresh data from source systems to drive their decisions around their assumptions, but also real-time data as you know, when your department owners are entering information into your, your, your plans, that's obviously driving what you're seeing in your own spaces. So let's begin with our ARR plan. And this is combining top-down and bottom-up planning to ensure, as we as Julio talked about quite rightly earlier, balancing meeting of the objectives of the business with realistic plans and insights from our budget owners or department heads. So leadership have set high-level targets and assumptions in our long-term plan space that we have here. And the output of that is what we're surfacing here in our budget space. So we talked about being able to surface but uh, you know, elements of your model anywhere in the tool. This is what, what we're essentially doing here. And this is then cascading down to our department level budget. So in the example of new ARR, our top down target is being cascaded down to our sales lead. They're then able to provide their bottoms up inputs and see how the two are tying together. And we can then use that to drive this business partnering, have those conversations around what we're able to do um, to meet to meet targets and objectives. So just to set the scene of what's going on here, because I'm, I'm conscious that maybe everybody or some people haven't seen um, Abacom before. What we've got here in this table is a number of variables that are coming from our ARR model. So variables are the numbers that matter to you, like ARR, revenue, cash balance, runway, just to give you a few examples. And within our models, we define these variables. What's great about these, as I mentioned, is they're defined once and then they're able to be surfaced or used anywhere within the platform. So, for example, we've defined average contract value um, in our model. We've also defined new customer logos. And these are kind of the basis or the, the, the key assumptions for our top down target. So this driver tree model uses inputs or takes inputs on both new customer logos and average contract value at both the location and product level and this gives and this is driving our new ARR output that we're seeing at the bottom here so if I just double click on this table you'll see these highlighted in blue indicating which of our variables and dimension dimension levels within those are manual inputs and are therefore able to be edited within this table so if we needed to adjust our long-term plan or our, our kind of budget for 2025 we could do so here in this table by just simply clicking on um, one of these elements. More on that in a second. We're going to do that through the sales leader space. So taking a look at the top down, then we're presenting a view of top down versus bottom up. How are we actually tying those in? How, how are they kind of matching up with one another? So we can, we've identified and we saw that commentary that we've, we've had kind of conversations going on in the tool where we've identified quite a significant gap towards the back end of, of 2025 for Q4. And we're going to show how our sales leader is kind of empowered to make their, their inputs. And we can also, as a finance team, drive that collaboration and business partner them to understand and, and, and kind of work with them to meet that gap. So the bottoms up plan here, we, we have visibility into it on our top level space, but this is coming from the sales budget owner space. So let's take a look at that. And this will give you a good idea of what a templated space for a budget owner could look like. So looks quite different. We've still got our metrics being surfaced at the top here. We've got a different budget workflow. We've given them some analysis of, of past data around how we performed in terms of ARR by geography, by product over time and how we're projecting for, for next year. But where we're getting to in this is identifying and, and kind of toying around with assumptions to to meet that gap. So 
This is addressed through our sales capacity plan here. Our sales leader able to provide inputs for headcount because this is our kind of driver model, the key assumptions that we've we've defined. So you do that by simply double clicking and this is tied into our headcount planning and, and our kind of model as well. So for example, all of the all the sales leader would need to do here is provide inputs that give given things like the start dates, the salary and bonus for each of these employees. And we're also collecting additional information. And these are, this is really configurable and, and I guess relevant to each and every business that we work with. But just to give you an indication of some, you know, that a quite typical position, location, department, but we're also capturing what segment are they going after? Is this going to be an enterprise account executive? That's going to drive what their quotas going to look like. You know, all of these additional data points we're able to capture in the tool through our really flexible dimensionality. What you'll also also notice as a last piece on this sales capacity plan is that we're actually also taking um, or, or using an approve, leveraging an approval process here. So this obviously has given you kind of control over what's being entered into plan. Your sales leader will only be able to enter new headcount at a requested status. Um, and then that is essentially rolling up into your top level view where you have the power over, you know, the ultimate decision over what's actually going to roll up into your plan. And we've got some um, really nice tables that we're going to show as we go through this. So that is our plan for ARR. And we're going to now take a look at expansion and churn. So this um, uh, uh, existing that was existing in our, sorry, now expansion and churn. So the inputs would typically sit, of course, with our CSM team. And I could pivot to their space to show you that. But let's just take a look at this in the context of our top level or parent space with finance. And then that allows us to roll through the rest of the demo in a single space without clicking through a couple of different areas. So similarly for expansion and churn, we've got this top down and bottoms up exercise but we're surfacing completely different variables from our model. So here for expansion, we have a similar top-down versus bottom-up exercise, as I mentioned, but an expansion percentage is driving our top-down view. And then if we look at this from a bottoms-up perspective, this is the table that will be sitting on the CSM's templated space where we're actually planning for um, at, at the individual client level what our you know, uplifts and our, our, our new, our existing ARR is likely to look like for 2025. So what we're doing here is bucketing our existing accounts into strategic versus non-strategic accounts. Again, just to show off kind of the dimensionality here, how we're bucketing and aggregating our, our data. Um, but just gives you an idea really of how, how we're able to flex and be kind of quite intricate across different elements of your ARR plan. And you may have noticed that we're not just able to play with our budget here. We have two other scenarios in play. And you, you may have noticed that across all of the tables that we've surfaced in this space. So um, with our budget, our bull and bear scenarios compared side by side, like we're doing here, this allows us and your budget owners to see how changes in assumptions, even market conditions impacts these revenue projections really giving you the ability to plan proactively, be agile and efficient and creating versions and scenarios in a tool so is so much easier. So for in Abacom, for example, it's, just, it's two clicks to create a new version, taking, you know, the same, the same variables. And then we're able to surface those in our visualizations, in our tables and compare them side by side. So just rolling through a couple of the ARR pieces here because we're about to now talk about some of the cost projections. Keeping an eye on time, I think we've got enough to go through this. So cost of sales could be flexed in, and, and managed in a different way, but what we're doing here is presenting a, a cost of sales as a, as a percentage of revenue, taking some inputs on production costs with regards to like data center and hosting, and that's driving our cost of sales top down number. And then here in our non-staff cost OPEX, we're basically getting a roll up of all of the inputs from across our different department heads all the way down at the vendor level. So these this would sit with each budget owner. But if I show you, for example, in our US subsidiary, 
at our advertising and marketing line item for the PL, we've got our top suppliers again being bucketed and allowing each of our um, budget owners to basically provide inputs with comparisons to last year as to what they expect or project their plans or their, their spend to be for the year. And really, we don't want to just bucket all of our OPEX together. So, for example, looking at marketing differently, we have a marketing cost table driven by CAC with insights into inbound versus outbound CAC. And, and that's driven our or informed our allocation of budget with outbound being the more cost effective, as we've identified through this visualization here with a higher return on investment for marketing efforts. So, you know, just again, showing the, you that flexibility of what we're, we're able to do in a tool and, and the ability to surface these super easy, simple as selecting your variables from a model. We've then got our staff costs and I'm moving through this fairly quickly to ensure that we've got enough time at the back end for questions. So here, again, some really nice stuff going on. We're actually taking our headcount inputs in local currency. So we're, of course, we have spaces for our different locations, the department owners there, and they're providing salary bonus inputs at a local currency. And that's being translated in the tool automatically. We've got some other drivers or assumptions around what our employer taxes are going to look like per location, pension contribution caps and commission attainments as well. And this is, again, just talking about this being that command center. So we've gone through so many different elements of our plan, surfacing really flexible visualizations. And what we're able to do specifically in this headcount piece here, we can see our total headcount cost projections for 2025. But if we roll down to the bottom here, we can see a headcount summary by status. So this is touching on that approvals piece. Um, basically, any of our budget owners that are requesting new, new hires, new headcount for uh, next year, this is rolling up into our view that we've got in this, this table. And we're then able to have that ultimate say, that ultimate decision. And we can make our decision based on the data that we're seeing in our different visualizations that we're surfacing here. So I think a final point here in today's session on this, this transformation really that moving to a tool can provide. We focused on budgeting, but we're not just transforming the planning exercise. So once your budget is set, our platform enables and empowers you to continually update forecasts based on actual performance and identify why, why variances occur in real time, taking action accordingly. So we can drill down into figures, you know, through, through multiple levels of dimensionality. But if we change our view of the PL here from this um, view view into 2025 um, and and show 2024's data and kind of picture ourselves in the position of having run through this annual planning process for 2024 in the prior year and see how rather than setting and forgetting the budget, we can monitor the performance versus plan throughout the year. So I'm just going to add an additional time th frame to this and that's quarter to date for 2024. Get rid of our other time frames that we've we've added into this to make the table nice and clean, and then let me just clean this up, versions version wise. So we've just got our forecast, our budget, and our actuals, and you can see here, I can surface automatically our variances. So as and when new data is fed into the tool, new actual new months are actualized. We're presenting this view to our end users with these dynamic tables really empowering our end users, but also taking that kind of time constraint that, you know, I'm sure we're, we're all kind of more than familiar with. So again, it's rather than setting and forgetting the budget, we monitor that performance and, and move to a continuous plan. So really allowing you to remain responsive and, and tie you more closely to those strategic goals and objectives. So I think to summarize and what we've walked through today, Hopefully you've seen how Abacom really transforms the annual, annual budgeting process, both in the short term, as we talked about initially, but right now, you know, when preparing the budget and, and in the long term, when monitoring performance, helping you align top down business strategy with financial planning, stakeholder collaboration, enhancing that data visibility and integrating those, those plans with one another, the top down and the bottom up budget. So, 
I'd, re I'd like to thank everyone for joining at this point. And I think I'll pass back over to you, Julio, right? And we'll open up the floor for questions. Yes. Thank you so much, James. That was that was great. Thank you for showing how, how the technology can really uh, have an impact in the budgeting season. And we have plenty of questions. I'm sure I'm not sure we'll have enough time to cover all of those, but we are more than happy to follow up separately and you know reach out to you guys and, and answer some of those. Uh, let's kick off with Ben Murray. So uh, thank you, Ben, for that question. Um, he's asking, curious how long you allow for budget season. So, hey, well, we've seen our customer base. I'll take that one first. Um, it largely depends. So those customers that are doing rolling um, forecasting, still, still, if you do rolling forecasting, you still want to do budgeting, right? So it's not you know, exclusive or anything. So still rolling. But then if you're do doing rolling forecasting and, and you have like this regular cadence, then your budgeting system becomes way smoother, obviously. So um, yeah, that's going to be a month, maybe like something, you know, everything is up and running. Um, we've seen other people we've consulted with that, you know, we've seen nightmares there, like up to six months, like crazy, right? So your budget is approved almost in by the, by the beginning of Q2. Um, nonsense, right? So there, there is a better way. So both extremes, usually, you know, for a healthy company, you know, two months sh should be more than enough. Um, James, this one is going to be for you. Um, knowing the two approaches of budget, bottom up or top down, what consideration will entice the approach for companies? What consideration will entice them to, to take on board that methodology? This is why I understood, yes. Okay. Um, I think the really the points that you made earlier on, Julio, right? It's allowing for those strategic objectives to be surfaced. Um, what are the you know, what are the goals for for the business from a leadership perspective? But then ensuring that you're balancing that, making it realistic by tying it to, you know, what what your different department leads feel is is achievable and yeah I, I i can see why maybe there is um a con you know point of contention over whether or not to adopt it because like again you said julio there's those difficult conversations that you need to have yes the tie the two together with one another um so yeah it, it, it like like you said right the the, the this this is the best of both worlds by doing taking on this the methodology. So being able to be strategic and, and drive the business forward, be ambitious, um, but also take into consideration unique insights from department owners and and you know make tie them in more closely to um the performance of their de their their departments. Hopefully well, that's 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 uh the answer along the right lines. Um and we've interpreted the question the right way. Well, thank, thank you so much. I've been replying to some of the questions uh, in writing. So um, maybe if we have time, I'll, I'll read some of those. Um, as a fintech and a bank, I have a particular focus on regulatory capital. Can I create a model for monitoring and managing regulatory capital? Uh, Mohammed, th thank you so much for the question, of course. Um, yes, 100%. So we have banks literally in our customer base, um, fintech, regulated fintechs with thousands of employees uh, that operate in multi-jurisdictions with heavy regulatory burdens. Um, so I feel for you. Um, and as, as we've enabled some of our customers to really navigate through that uh, reporting and, and monitoring that they need to get done. So yeah, 100%, you can build any of those models in the platform and then forecast budget at the balance sheet level, equity level, like all that stuff. So 100% that's doable and we work with from banking circle to donor bank to, you know, some other uh, larger institutions like Kibori and so on. But um, another another question we have here is how Abacom integrates um, AI. I'm more, more than happy to follow up on that separately. That's another whole new chapter. So um, probably we need, to, we need more time for that. Um, we also have a question on what size of businesses Abacom um, if the solution is ideally um, fits. Look, 
startup SMB enterprises, hey, we are mid market, right? So that that means that we typically work with companies, one hundred employees, two hundred probably, all the way to thousands of employees, three, four thousand employees. So this is this is our sweet spot. So we are really scalable. That's a message. It's very important for us. Hopefully, in in the product demo, you you saw the flexibility in terms of dimensionality or data cleaning that the product has. We really scale with companies as their as their um, needs evolve. Right. But this is this is the type of companies we work with. In the previous slide, you saw logos in the say two hundred employees all the way to thousands. Look, I've answered a few questions, so um, I'll I'll drop one of those now here. Can can you do multi project, so multi year? So if you are in a startup and then you want to plan for a few years, right, to see when you are in break even, can you do that in the platform? Yes, hundred percent. So we 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 definitely do that long range planning. That's a very important use case for us. Um, are you able to lock a budget version to understand movement uh, from an iteration? Um, James, do you want to tackle that one? Yeah, yeah, you absolutely are able to do that. So there's kind of version control functionality built into Abacom. We, we can allow you to lock any of your versions, um, you know, create duplicates of them. So you, you can kind of save a snapshot in time view of one budget, for example, a, a version of the budget, lock that and then um, kind of use that duplicated version moving forward. So, yeah, lots of stuff we can do there. Cool. And hey, maybe one last question. Um, if you are an enterprise-oriented company, right, and you have a situation where your top 25 logos, you know, are most of your revenue and then everything else, are there templates that support budgeting for those top 25 individually and then have a model flow demonstrated for the rest of the business? And hey, hundred percent. So in Avacom, you can model at the customer level, um, very easily, right? Depend with with different drivers by customer. Like you, you can you can do it very very flexibly, and then you can have the rest of the revenue. And we definitely have um, many enterprise customers with with that. You can also do that for OPEX as well, right? So it's the same thing for OPEX. You can actually forecast budget, play scenarios at the vendor level. So it's that level of granularity that, that we've been here. And yes, we have templates to make it easy, but also, you know, we, we you know, you don't need templates basically. So don't, we don't have rigidity there. You don't need to fit in our templates. If our templates work fantastic, otherwise you can model anything you want really, it's really flexible. Um, folks, thank you so much. Um, we're gonna leave it there. I'm looking at the, <laughs> The clock now, we, we have one, two minutes left. So we wanted to um, say thank you. Thank you for joining. Thank you for sharing your time to learn more about you know the budgeting season, the challenges, uh, the best practices that we can start incorporating today. And hey, hopefully you also liked uh, how technology can really multiply you as you think how to make your um, next budget season uh, feel like a breeze. Um, uh, don't forget uh, winter is coming so let, let's get ready for for that new chapter that is around the corner good james any any last uh comments no really really um appreciate everybody joining for your time um there's so much to talk about with the products and i can see some of these questions we've piqued curiosity which is great um and a lot of the the questions we have things built out in different spaces to to answer those so um, for those that are interested, would love to set up some time um, to have those conversations. But again, really appreciate everybody uh, joining the session and hope it was super useful. Okay. Thank you so much, James. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, stay in touch and uh, looking forward to the next one. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everybody.